Here's another circuit diagram that we found inside the Mullard book. This one is for the Stern mixer four channel circuit. And you have two mic amplifiers and a radio input as well on the other end. This book is available as a digital scan up on our eBay website. And you can get that for £2.95. Uh, the pickup input is for crystal output. And um, it's got the EF86 valves with the ECC83 dual triode type as well. Stern made this unit at £10. You can see it up here. And uh, there was an upgrade um, adaption for ribbon microphones and for moving coil type microphones. At a later date, we're going to use R1 in the recording studio and we will update the input stage with a transformer, probably by Jensen or Lundhall or Cinemag, uh, one of those three companies, and also an output transformer as well, so it's all balanced and healthy for the recording studio at 200 ohms, low impedance type. And uh, right now we're going to take you over to Phil Moss, who will take you through the circuit diagram. Stern Mullard Design Mixer. This basically comes from the Mullard circuit book, but this one is built to be freestanding and therefore it has a mains power supply. Whereas in the Mullard book, they didn't bother with that. It's as straightforward as you can get with a decent performance. Some of these mixers, they were passive on all the inputs, resistively mixed, and that's pretty naff. But this one does do the microphones properly with the EF86. Very straightforward front panel as you can see here. Four jacks, four volume controls, no tone controls or frills, no facility for cartridge input unless it's a fairly flat one, in which case you've got the pickup input and it would also work into the radio input. Right, that's the front panel. Now move on and look at the internals and the circuit diagram. So here we are. The inputs, I have to say, there's a lot to criticize about this Mullard circuit. So the inputs appear to be for crystal microphones because of the very high impedance of the input. If you look at it, there is a 10 mega ohm grid leak. This uses grid current bias, which has a number of undesirable characteristics. It might be cheap in that you don't need a cathode resistor and bypass capacitor, but the distortion is higher and the gain is lower and the noise of that resistor will be amplified. So the first thing I would do, frankly, with this is to modify it, put a cathode resistor and bypass capacitor and reduce the grid leak to about a mega ohm. If you're using a dynamic microphone, one wants really to have a step-up transformer. Of course, a lot of microphone, uh, sorry, yes, microphones which are dynamic have the transformer built in. Otherwise, you'll need an external one. You can probably bolt it on the back of the box. The only problem possibly being that the mains transformer is not of the first quality and you may get hum induction. If you're installing it internally or on the back, it is worth rotating it to see at what angle you get the least hum. They do specify that one uses high stab resistors for the grid leaks, the anode and the screen resistors. And in fact, the Stern unit is built with those. As you'll see, the Stern built unit is actually very nice. I'm sorry I'm stumbling on my words. I promise you I have not been drinking or doing, taking anything worse. I'll try and do better. So you've got an output coupling capacitor into a volume control for the channel. That then goes into a common bus for mixing from all the inputs. The second input is identical to the first one for microphone. You then have a radio and pickup input. They're basically the same thing, although the radio input has a higher value resistor feeding into the mixer, it's 470k instead of 390k. Um, passive inputs, there is no volume control on the radio input, they're assuming the radio has its own. Well, 
If it's a tuner, it probably doesn't, so actually one does need a volume control. And in fact, on the Stern mixer, there is. The pickup input does have one. Obviously, this is intended for a crystal pickup with a high level. It's fed into the first half of the ECC83, which is not entirely conventional. You'll see it's rather odd, in fact. Um, it mixes the four inputs and there is some negative feedback across it into the grid. The negative feedback also stabilises the input impedance um, regardless of how the four volume controls are set. So it will to some extent reduce interaction between the various inputs. Notice that the anode load is rather strange. You've got 100k, which sounds conventional, but look where the output to the next stage is taken from. It's from across a mere 5.6k. So the vast majority of the signal delivered at the anode is not fed to the next stage. The reason for this is that this was intended for use with a rather sensitive power amplifier, which therefore only needed a small input voltage. They do say in the Mullard design that if that you want a higher output one can change the ratio of these resistors. Um, I certainly would. I think I would take my output actually from the anode and put a decoupling capacitor there. The output half is used as a cathode follower so it has a very high input impedance. It isn't that megohm, it's that megohm multiplied by the gain of the valve which used as a common cathode stage could be as much as 100. So you could get an input impedance in theory of 100 megohms. In practice I doubt it but it's probably more than 10 anyway. The anode resistor here is merely for decoupling with its 16 microfarad, which seems a very generous capacitor. So here you've got a 0.1 microfarad capacitor feeding the output, conventional bias, and then there's a 47k to develop the signal across for the output. And that is all there is. If you were building this circuit from scratch, I suggest that you could put in um, tone controls into here there's plenty of gain because you can take the signal from this anode, as I suggested, um, to drive either the Mullard passive tone controls or you could put Baxendall between this valve and the first half. In that case, you wouldn't have uh, the low impedance of a cathode follower. The obvious answer being to add another triode. If you built this in stereo, then one could use something like an ECC81 or 82 as the cathode follows half each for each channel. Right, if we now look at the way Stern has constructed it, you'll see that it is actually done remarkably well. So here we have the unit from the top. Very simple, we've got two EF86s on the left and the ECC83 with the screening can on. The EF86s don't need a screening cam because they're internally screened, but you will notice that the sockets they've used have skirts. So you could put cans on them, but the important thing there is that the exposed unscreened area at the bottom where the valve proper connects to its pins is screened. The, out, the uh, mains transformer, as I said earlier, is not of the first quality. It's perfectly adequate, I'm sure. Um, but unlike a professional mixer, where this would almost certainly be in a mu metal can, um, it's exposed and therefore it is likely to cause hum. Electrostatic hum is suppressed by having an electrolytic can in front of it, the aluminium can, acting as a barrier. To some extent, it is also a barrier between the mains connection, uh, connections on the back that I've highlighted on the switch and the rest of the circuit, but obviously it is not a barrier to hum being induced into the front section, the volume control. But being a traditional metal pot, there probably wasn't any, and it is at this point quite a high level. Um, 
Modern pots can be a problem because they tend to have plastic bodies and once the pot itself may be of a high quality, if you have the mains on the back of it, it isn't suitable for use at low level signals because of harm. You can see the signal summing resistors along here going to a tag board. There's not really anything else to say about the top of this so I shall now move to the bottom. Right, I don't associate Stern, and I'm not saying this in any rude way, but they were mainly for hobbyists and they did lots of kits. So I wouldn't have been surprised if there was a mess under this chassis. In fact, we find two things. Firstly, it is very nicely built. And secondly, they have used high quality components. I did point out on the Mallard circuit that it said used high stab resistors. If you look here, 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 and here, and here, you can see these pink resistors, which were almost certainly patent ones. These are carbon film high stabs. This is military grade stuff. So where it matters, they've used good resistors. Up here, they've used ordinary carbon composition resistors. And if you measure the values, depending on the maker of them, and you can't tell from the look, they may still be good and they may be hopeless. Um, if replacing them nowadays, there'll be metal film anyway, so there'll be low noise. Now, there are some people who will immediately throw out all the electrolytics, of which there's one there, another, another, and then the can. My bet would be that those electrolytics are still fine. At most, they might need a little bit of reforming before they're used, but I'm sure they're fine, and I certainly wouldn't throw them out unless I found evidence to convict them. On the far right here, we have a solid state rectifier, a metal oxide stack. If the HT voltage is low, blame it. They don't have an infinite life. They don't last as long often as valve rectifiers. You may need to change this. If you use silicon, then you will probably find that the HT voltage becomes excessive, but all you have to do is to experiment with values of series resistor. It's a bridge rectifier, so there's only two connections from the mains transformer. Um, in fact, if you left one of the working diodes in here in series with the silicon bridge, it will probably act as the resistor. The other thing to do, one there, two, little one there, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine tucked in the corner. They're all Hunts capacitors, and it will be amazing if they're not leaking and leaking badly, so they can all go in the bin. Even if they're a more respectable make after all these years, being wax paper capacitors within those uh, plastic shells, they will almost certainly be leaky, so one throws them away. If one wants to test instead of doing that, then measure the grid voltages on the ECC83. If it's positive, you know one of them at least is leaking and the output capacitor will almost certainly leak. Something else, it's fine if the thing is used plugged up, but there is no bleeder resistor connected to the output. So even if it's a perfectly good capacitor, if you plug into the output, there will be a thump as it charges up. If you put a resistor to earth from there, um, it can be a high value, a mega ohm, 10 mega ohms, it doesn't matter, but it will discharge the DC that will otherwise be waiting for you. A final point, this unit was supplied with what nowadays one will think of as bell flex. It's the transparent two core mains. It was legal when it was put on a long time ago. It's not legal anymore although obviously on an old unit it is, but I suggest you throw it away and fit a modern regulation compliant mains lead. I would put a three core and I would earth the chassis. Now there is the problem you could have a hum loop created with an earth power amplifier or indeed anything else earthed. The answer to that is somewhere along it is to break the signal 
earth and put a resistor of 10 to 100 ohms in, but to earth all units which have metal boxes. And that is that. If you found this tutorial very useful and would like to see more, then please subscribe to our YouTube channel, Patreon, Facebook and Twitter accounts. So far to date we have covered dozens of vintage valve amplifiers and equipment, starting with basic items such as Danset, Bush and Philips record players. We have also covered the Mullard 33 and the 510 valve amplifiers, the mic amp and mixer circuit based around the EF86, the Hacker and Dynatron record players, uh, Leak TL10, Quad valve amplifiers, GEC MOV division, Radford, Pi, Dynaco Stereo 70 and many other British and foreign audio circuits. We are in the process of shooting lots more videos on a regular basis and we will be uploading often. We cover hi-fi, musicians and recording studio equipment as well as vintage radio circuits. Please go to the website for more details.